Good morning, saints. Good morning. Good morning. Please stand and join me in our call to worship. We come here today not because we are clever, but because God welcomes the slow learners. We come here not because we are wise, but because God loves us in spite of our folly. We come knowing that the greatest persons will be found among those who humbly served like Jesus did, and that the brightest ideas and the deepest truth will come from those who see themselves as little children in Christ's school. O oh Lord, open our mind and hearts and enable our lives to declare your praise. Amen. Amen. Today our praise song is holy, holy, holy. Now like the rain is falling down, now we want the Lord to send his Holy Ghost right on down. Amen? Amen. So let's give the Lord a hand cup of praise as we invoke his presence. So please join us. Holy, holy, holy.
So we ask you now, Father, in your infinite generosity to look on us in this moment, seeing us all and seeing us each what we need from you. Speak to somebody who's come into this moment of worship with questions that only you can answer. Touch somebody who's come into this moment with, with a need that only you can meet. Bless in a mighty way. Let your Holy Spirit move through and in us all and in us each in such a way that we are free to praise you as you deserve to be praised. Free to give you glory for you are entitled to all the glory. Free to forgive so that we do not leave this place with the burdens of bitterness, grudges, free to seek your forgiveness, to confess our sins, to repent from every fault and failing, so that we do not leave this place as broken as we were when we arrived. Somebody needs you to heal their body. Somebody needs you to restore their spirit. Somebody needs you to just move a little closer so that all the stress and all the business and busyness of this moment, they remember. You will not leave us. You will not forsake us. So we thank you. We thank you for this chance to worship. We thank you for the gift of Jesus Christ that allows us to have hope of redemption to live in the certainty of a heavenly home. And we pray that what we do in these next moments we have together you will see you will smile. But we love you. Scripture comes to us from the book of Malachi, chapter 1, verse 6 through 14. A son honors his father, and a servant his master. If then I am the father, where is my honor? And if I am a master, where is my reverence, says the Lord of hosts, to you priests who despise my name? Yet you say, in what way have we despised your name? You offer defiled food on my altar, but say, In what way have we defiled you by saying, The table of the Lord is contemptible? And when you offer the blind as a sacrifice, is it not evil? And when you offer the lame and sick, is it not evil? Offer it then to your governor. Would he be pleased with you? Would he accept you favorably? Says the Lord of hosts. But now entreat God's favor that he may be gracious to us. While this is being done by your hands, will he accept you favorably, says the Lord of hosts, who is there even among you who will shut the doors so that you would not kindle fire on my altar in vain. I have no pleasure in you, says the Lord of hosts, nor will I accept an offering from your hands. For from the rising of the sun, even to his going down. My name shall be great among the Gentiles, and every place incense shall be offered to my name. And if you're offering, for my name shall be great among the nations, says the Lord of hosts. But you profane it, in that you say, the table of the Lord is defiled, and his fruit, his food is contemptible. You also say, oh, what a weariness, and you sneer at it, says the Lord of hosts. And you bring the stolen, the lame, and the sick. Thus you bring an offering. Should I accept this from your hands, says the Lord? But cursed be the deceiver who has in his flock a male, and takes a vow, 
but sacrifices to the Lord what is blemished. For I am a great king, says the Lord of hosts, and my name is to be feared among the nations. Thus in the reading of the word, the word of God for the people of God. Amen. Amen. Won't you stand, please, for our affirmation of faith? Let us unite in this historic confession of the Christian faith. What is it that we believe? I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered on the Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. Amen. And you may be seated. New Testament reading comes from the book of Acts, Acts 4, 32, 5, and 11. Now the multitude of those who believed were of one heart and one soul. Neither did anyone say that any of the things he possessed was his own, but they had all things in common. And with great power, the apostles gave witness to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And a great grace was upon them all. Nor was there anyone among them who lacked. All who were possessors of lands or houses sold them and brought the proceeds of those things that were sold and laid them at the apostles' feet. And they distributed to each as everyone had need. And Hosea's who was also named Barnabas by the apostles, which is translated as son of encouragement, a Levite of the country of Cyprus. Having land, sold it, and brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. But a certain man named Ananias, with Sapphira and his wife, sold a possession. And he kept that part of the proceeds, his wife also being aware of it and brought a certain part of and laid it at the apostles' feet. But Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and keep back part of the price of the land for yourself? While it remained, was it not your own? And after it was sold, was it not in your own control? Why have you conceived this thing in your heart? You have not lied to man, but to God. Then Ananias, hearing these words, fell down and breathed his last. So great fear came upon all those who heard these things. And the young man arose and wrapped him up and carried him out and buried him. Now it was about three hours later that his wife came in, not knowing what had happened. And Peter answered her, Tell me whether you sold the land for so much. She said, Yes, for so much. Then Peter said to her, How is it that you have agreed together to test the spirit of the Lord? Look, the feet of those who have buried your husband are at the door, and they will carry you out. Then immediately she fell down at the feet and breathed her last. And the young man came in and found her dead, and carrying her out, buried her by her husband. So great fear came upon all the church and upon all who heard these things. Does into the reading of the word, the word of God, for the people of God. Amen. You all hear me clearly in the back. 
it's good to be heard. Last week I found out I was talking and everybody wasn't hearing me. And so it's good to be heard. God speaks to us a lot more than we give him credit for. Sometimes God just ain't heard. Him. But he isn't heard not because he lacks the volume, but because sometimes we just don't want to hear what the Lord has to say. The Lord says that he gives generously out of the abundance of his heart. That he asks, he requires of us to give back a portion of that. You don't have to give it all back, but just a portion of what he's given. We give the tithe, the 10% of God's financial blessings as an act of faith, an act of obedience, an act of love, appreciation, respect. But whatever it is, if you're in a place in your finances where you can't give that 10% and make your rent, then don't tithe. Get it together. Give what you can and grow. But in the act of not time, remember that it is God who is taking care of you. In the act of giving less than you wish you could, remember that it is God who is helping you to improve your situation. And when you reach the point where God has answered your prayer, then fulfill an obligation. If you're in a place where you're after that point and God has blessed you to be able to pay your bills, do what you're supposed to do, and you tie, and you start thinking, well, you know, I really want to ball out on vacation. Tied anyway. Because you are remembering the same thing you remember before. You're remembering that God took care of you when you couldn't. So why would you think God ain't going to take care of you when you can't? Can you hear me? Oh, yes. God is good to us. Oh, yes. He is good to us when we're not good to him. God is good to us when we are not good to ourselves. And so we come into this moment of giving. Not because it is a moment of stiff and unreasonable obligation, but because it is a chance for us to tell God, I hear you. I, I hear you. I, I see you. I see you taking care of me. I see you bringing me through circumstances I could not have brought myself through. And I want others to see that too. I want those who are where I used to be to know that God takes care of them. And so above our tithe and our offering, we, we give towards benevolence. So the church always has funds set aside for those who are in need, in tragedy, in emergencies, in distress. We give because God has given to us. And so you can do what I did this morning. On my way in, my wife was driving, and so I just opened, pulled out my phone and went to my Give a Fire app, and, Click on my tithe, my offerings for the day. You can go to paypal.me on your phone or your other device and paypal.me slash baby tabernacle seeing me and give. You can, if you're at home, write your check or money order, put it in the mail to baby tabernacle seeing me church, PO Box 3145, Tuscaloosa 3543. If you're here, you can take that envelope in your chair. Insert your offering for the day. Drop it off on your way in or on your way out. And even do it. You don't have to do what other folks do. God has blessed you in unique ways. You have needs other folks don't all have. But do what you can. Where you are. Remember. But you hear God take care of you. Amen. 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 Reverend Brown, would you come and offer a blessing for those who give and for those who may not be able to give Let us bow.
Father, we thank you for another opportunity to enrich and enhance your kingdom through our giving, Lord, because you have given everything to us. You sent your only Son, Jesus, into the world to die for our sins, that we might be reconciled back to the Father, and that we might know the truth. It's in our giving that we express your love, your kindness, and your goodness to those who are less fortunate than we are, those maybe who have fallen on hard times, those through no fault of their own, may not be able to get up right now, but through the giving, we pray that somebody will be helped, somebody's life will be made better, and somebody's life will take a different turn, and they will give their lives to you. Our Father, we thank you for the blessings that you have sent us, and it's through those blessings that we bless others. In your holy name we pray, amen. This is our altar call. You can sit where you are because God answers prayer, sincere prayer, from anywhere. It doesn't matter about the posture as long as your heart is sincere. And if your heart is sincere, God answers. He hears and answers prayer. So won't you talk to Him today? And as that song says, stop talking about your problems and tell your problems about your God because He's able to handle anything that might come up in your life. Won't you talk to God today? Amen.
Jesus is my Savior. Through Acts chapter 5, verse 11. 
In this passage, we see a story about the early church collectively and a story about a few specific members of that church individually. And if we will look into that scripture, if we will receive what the word has to say, then today we begin to reclaim the might of the church. And so the title of this message is We Are Our Ancestors. We are our ancestors. Our spiritual ancestors in the New Testament church formed a community characterized by four precious qualities. There was boldness. There was unity. There was power. And there was integrity. Boldness, unity, power, and integrity. These qualities are available to us too, but we fail to possess them because present culture, sometimes inadvertently, sometimes deliberately, misinterprets the meaning of boldness, unity, power, and integrity. By boldness, we don't mean the kind of religious obnoxiousness that too often we see in the American church. The church in the book of Acts didn't line up to scream at pregnant girls or soldiers under orders not to respond. The church in the Bible didn't open carry swords and spears and march through Jerusalem yelling, God hates Greeks and Gentiles go home. That's not boldness. The American church operates from a position of historical power. American Christians, yes, particularly white evangelical American Christians, presume that governmental force is and should be on their side. That's not boldness. That's privilege. Privilege is when you believe Jesus gave you the right to scream in the face of a police officer and have the officer back there. Boldness, as demonstrated, demonstrated by the biblical apostles, is manifest when you show up knowing the police are probably going to walk past everybody else and grab you. Biblical boldness is the zeal to share the truth of Jesus Christ when you're the one being screamed at. You're the one being spit on. You're the one threatened by armed angels of the law who can physically and legally abuse you with impunity. In Acts chapter 4, Peter and John were arrested. And when they were arrested, they preached Jesus to their territory. After their release, while under a restraining order prohibiting them from preaching Jesus, they got together with the church and they prayed. In Acts 4, 29, they said, Now, Lord, look on their threats and grant to your servants that with all boldness we may speak your word. They prayed. And in Acts 4, 31, it says, When they prayed, the place where they were assembled together was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit, and they spoke the word of God with Boldness. The original church was a bold church. Yes. Not a privileged church, but a bold church. And the qualities that define the church, that, that boldness is available to us today because we are those spiritual ancestors. We are the same church that God commissioned. And we can have the same boldness. Unity. Biblical unity is about, is about bringing people in, not keeping people under. The New Testament church's unity was different from what we practice in Western Christian society. The Western church defines unity by how much control flows up to the few who are in authority. The New Testament church defined unity by how much help flowed down to the many people who were otherwise powerless. Today, church unity is typically about consolidating power and authority. Consolidated authority, though, requires compromise. And unfortunately, that usually ends up being moral compromise. It, it, it's like, okay, we won't bring up homosexuality as a sin, if, if you don't bring up all that adultery as a sin, and then we can be united. 
not. It, it, it's like we won't call out domestic abusers and swindlers in the pews if you don't call out abusers and embezzlers in the pulpits. And then we can be united. And sometimes the compromise is, is deliberately creating a state of confusion where we can't tell sin from tradition. It, it, it's like We'll ignore all the arrogance and rudeness and self-worship, but everybody's got to dress up and sign for automatic bank drafts on their tithes so we can be one united body. Our new tradition replaces the condemnation of sin with the presentation of fake holiness. And you got to understand, it's a trick. It's a hustle. And here, here's the hustle. When you compromise your morality, yes. you don't become more free. Mm -hmm. You become less free. That's why the devil tempts you to sin. He's not trying to free you. Yielding to temptation places you under his control. Mm -hmm. And when you accept a political, social, or religious standard of morality that is lower than what God, God calls you to in the name of us all coming together. You surrender a little bit of your soul to the people at the top of the high. The American church has lost its moral authority because America sees too many Christian institutions that are more concerned with protecting its authority and its privileges than with being true to the moral obligations of the Word of God. Mm -hmm. Contrast, the New Testament church grew in influence even while it was being actively suppressed because rather than concentrating authority, the New Testament church shared responsibility. Mm -hmm. Acts 4 verse 32. Now the multitude of those who believed were of one heart and one soul. Neither did anyone say that any of the things he possessed was his own, but they had all things in common. Verse 34 and 35 say, Nor was there anyone among them who lacked, for all who were possessed of land or houses sold them and brought the proceeds of the things that were sold and laid them at the apostles' feet, and they distributed to each as anyone has need. That's in the Bible. That's what the church did. American Christian unity shuts out many as possible. It, it hoards power. It says we are on the inside and we are special. We are on the inside and therefore we are better. But the New Testament church's unity shares power with the least of these, with as many as had need, and thus brings more into the community. American churches operate in spirits of fear and scarcity. They're so afraid that if we let those people in, then our power will be diluted. But that's only true that we are operating outside of God. Because human power is scarce. Human power is temporal, earthly, carnal, and limited. But the true church operates in the power of God, and God's power is infinite. The Holy Spirit doesn't have a maximum workload. Jesus isn't worried about checking his account balance. Psalm 24, 1, the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world and all they that dwell therein. The more we give of God's love, the stronger and more unified we become all and each. The more we share opportunities for connection and leadership in the church, the stronger and more unified we become all and each. We must not confuse our cultural traditions and our social preferences with moral absolutes. But that doesn't mean that we compromise on the truth. It doesn't mean we pretend that sin isn't still sin. The story of the church in the book of Acts testifies that we can boldly proclaim the whole truth of the gospel and grow together in humble unity. In fact, the Bible shows that this is the only way the church will work. The New Testament church, the church of our ancestors in spirit, the church that we are, 
was a, was a church characterized by boldness, by unity, and also by power. Acts 4.33. And with great power the apostles gave witness to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. Biblical power is not limited by process. In Mark 10, Mark chapter 10, Jesus healed a blind man by simply declaring, Go your way, your faith has made you well, and immediately he received his son. But in John chapter 9, Jesus healed a blind man by spinning on the ground, making a clay poultice for his eyes, and sending him away to wash in the pool of Siloam. And John 9, 7 says he went his way, washed, and came back seeing. Both healings, different processes. And Luke 4, Jesus cast out a demon by saying simply, be quiet and come out of them. And John 4, 35 says, when the demon had thrown him in that midst, it came out of him and didn't hurt him. Split the word, happened. But in Luke 8, Jesus asked the demon what was his name negotiated with the evil spirit the opportunity to redirect it into a herd of swine. Different approaches. But in both cases, the possessed person was delivered. The church today has access to the same healing power that was manifest in the New Testament church. Think about, think about what, what healing power means essentially. It means people who are sick and couldn't get help anywhere else came to the church, and the church made sure they were made well. People who were owned by personal demons came to the church, and the church set them free, mind, body, and soul. Though few today demonstrate the power to instantly heal bodies with a word or a touch, the power to heal is still present in the church. The power is the same even if our processes tend to be different. We help someone with a copay that they couldn't cover. We help somebody sign up for insurance so they can get the right care. We teach and empower people to advocate for themselves so that health needs aren't minimized just because they aren't on the midpoint of the standard deviation of the approved progress chart. When the church uses all the power that God has made available to us to make sure that those who come to us get the healing touch they need, then the church today is still working signs and wonders just as surely as Peter and John. Ancient demons carry names like Beelzebub, Abaddon, and Legion. Demons today go by names like panic, addiction, depression. PTSD. For casting out demons, the church has more tools than olive oil and screaming. We have the tools of prayer and therapy. We have the tools of fasting on behalf of the afflicted and referring in the rehab programs. We can fast and pray and host and partner with other agencies. In every age, God gives his people what they need to do his will. The power of God is manifest when we embrace the power God has provided and whatever process that power worked through to serve this present age. We have signs and wonders to work, and we have wonder-working power too. We are the church of our spiritual ancestors. The New Testament church was characterized by boldness, by unity, by power, and by integrity. Times are different today, but people are basically the same as they were 2,000 years ago. Amen. Then, just like now, integrity isn't always the given in the church. The New Testament church, just like the 21st century church, had some members who lived by integrity and had some members who were obsessed with their image. Consider the story of Barnabas, Ananias, and Sapphira. Ananias is a Hebrew name that means favorite of the Lord. His wife, Sapphira, was named after the sapphire jewel, a name that in Aramaic means beautiful. Joseph had earned the nickname, Joseph or Jose, in some of your translations, earned the nickname Barnabas 
which is Hebrew for son of encouragement or son of comfort. So what we have here is a man, a successful man, and his pretty wife, and a really nice guy. And they were all members of the same First Church of Jerusalem. They were all landowners, owners, and they all made significant financial contributions to the church. But Barnabas made his contribution with integrity. Acts 4 36. And Jose, who was also named Barnabas by the apostles, which is translated son of encouragement or son of comfort, a Levite of the country of Cyprus, having land, sold it, brought the money, and laid it at the apostles' feet. And Ananias and Sapphira made a contribution, but not out of integrity. They made it out of concern for their image. Acts 5, 1 and 2. But a certain man named Ananias, with Sapphira and his wife, sold a possession and kept back part of the proceeds, his wife also being aware of it, and brought a certain part and laid it at the apostles' feet. Now, that may not seem like a big deal, but let's put that in contemporary terms. There's a church, and in that church, everybody loves Brother Joseph. He's a sweet, generous man with a gift for knowing exactly what to say to lift people up right when they're at their lowest point. Not only does he say comforting things, but he does amazingly encouraging things. He goes out of his way to help youth who have fallen by the wayside. He goes out of his way to make people who came from the outside feel like part of the church. He, he vouches for people. He, he's the kind of guy who would get up in the middle of the night and, and go all the way across three states just to help you because the Lord put your name on his heart. Brother Joseph was such a good man that people in the church didn't even call him Joseph anymore. They called him Mr. Comfort. They called him Brother Encourage. And no one was surprised when Joseph accepted the calling to minister as a missionary. They weren't even surprised to learn that Joseph had sold his house and quietly handed the pastor a check for the entire money. When word got out that Joseph had donated the whole thing to the church, everyone just smiled and shook their heads and said, that sounds like something Brother Encourager would do. Mm -hmm. Brother Joseph was the standard of Christian love by which every member of the church subconsciously measured themselves. But there was a successful man named Ananias and his beautiful wife, Sapphira, who wanted to be like Brother Joseph. Or rather, they wanted to look like they were like Brother Joseph. One day, their Sunday service, Ananias and Sapphira asked the pastor for a point of personal privilege. They wanted to share their testimony. And they told the congregation this beautiful, tearful story about how the Lord had blessed them to own multiple properties, and they've been thinking about selling one, and when the Holy Spirit put them on their hearts to bless the church, they arranged for the full amount of the sale to go directly to the church, because they knew that the law was going to give it back to them, a hundredfold. You know, church, they said, it ain't about being blessed, it's about being blessed. So here they said, is a check for $200,000. Praise the Lord. Except they actually sold the land for 400000 <laughs> And they redirected the other half of the real estate income to a secret account that they kept on the side. Mm -hmm. And on their taxes, they listed the entire 400000 as a charitable donation. So not only did they not pay any taxes, but they got back a sizable refund. Mm -hmm. Now, our contemporary version of the story is a tale of money laundering, tax evasion that would eventually lead to an audit in jail time. But when Ananias and Sapphira were the New Testament lie, the IRS was the least of their words. Because Acts 5 said that when Ananias came in, Peter called him aside and asked him, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and keep back part of the price of the land for yourself? When it remained, was it not your own? And after it was sold, was it not in your control? Why have you done this thing? You haven't lied to men. You lied to God. And Ananias fell down there. He carried him out. 
Three hours later, his wife shows up. I don't know why she was late for the appointment. It was three hours. Make sure you get that. But comes into Pastor Peter's office and he asks, "Tell me the truth, now. Did you really sell the land for this amount?" "Yeah, Pastor," she said. And Peter said, "How is it that you've agreed together to test the spirit of the Lord? Look, the feet of those who buried your husband at the door." Out there. Now, Ananias and Sapphira didn't have to donate all of the property sales to the church. They could have given the tithe. They could have not given the tithe. They didn't have to donate any of the property sale to the church. They could have kept all of the money for themselves. The problem was not the amount. The problem was the deception. The Lord loves integrity, and he demands integrity of his people, even if integrity doesn't seem profitable in the short term. Proverbs 27, the righteous man walks in his integrity, his children are blessed after him. Proverbs 28, 6, better is the poor who walks in his integrity than one perverse in his ways, though he be rich. God loves integrity, and conversely, God hates dishonesty. Proverbs 6, verses 16 through 19. These six things the Lord hates, yet these seven are an abomination to him. A proud look, a lying tongue, hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that devises wicked plans, feet that are swift to run into evil, a false witness who speaks lies, and one who shows discord among brothers. Of seven things that God hates, two of them are lying. If like Ananias and Sapphira, you are in church lying to make yourself look good. That's pride, which is three of the seven abominations in one life. The book of Proverbs. Understand, it is a communique from the king to his son. Like the book of Acts and the rest of the Bible, these words are addressed to believers. Yes, there are warnings about being overly influenced by outsiders and unbelievers. But when scripture states that God takes integrity as seriously as life and death, he isn't warning the world, he is warning the children of the king. Amen. Ananias and Sapphira chose their image over integrity, and God snatched away their future. The Old Testament king Saul chose his image over integrity, and God took away his king. Adam and Eve were more worried about what they were wearing than confessing what they had done and God evicted them from paradise. God hates it when church folk lie to make themselves look good. And God loves it when we come to him honestly, confessing our failures, admitting our faults, being honest about our feelings. John wrote in 1 John 1, 8-9, we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth isn't it. But if we confess our sin, yeah. he is faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us of all unrighteousness. Peter wrote in 1 Peter 5, 5, God resists the proud but gives grace to the humble. When we honestly humble ourselves before the Lord and confess our sins without pretense, we open a path for God to forgive us where we have sinned, to fix us where we are broken, and to fill us with power where we're insufficient. For God gives grace to the humble, and his grace is sufficient. For God's strength is made perfect in our weakness. The New Testament church was made up of imperfect people, just like our church. Everyone didn't always live up to their ideals, just like our church. They lived in a world that wanted to either silence, exploit, or corrupt them from the way of Jesus, just like our church. Our church lives in a world just like that, but through prayer and worship and attention to God's word, the original church persisted and multiplied and changed the world just like our church has, just like our church can, just like our church will, because we are answer. We will reclaim the boldness, unity, power, and integrity 
to define the apostles as boldness, unity, power, and integrity was defined in the apostles. We will boldly speak the whole truth of Jesus. We will speak the gospel truth to power, and we will speak the gospel truth to the powers. And though we speak it, we will not use this filthy filter of privilege the beautiful bones of God's love. We will unite as a community of faith, combining our resources to multiply our impact rather than hoarding our gifts to concentrate our power. We will move in the power of the Holy Spirit, working signs and wonders that lead to the healing of the sick, the casting out of evil powers, to the deliverance of bodies and minds and souls, and we will exercise Holy Ghost power through every tool and process in which God has blessed us to serve this present age. We will live and we will worship with integrity. Not hiding, but confessing our sins, not cultivating our image, honestly pursuing our better selves in Christ, not arrogantly pretending that we're already living our best life. We will live and worship with integrity as if our lives depend on <coughs> This we will do because it is our spiritual work. This we will do because it is our unaltered charge to keep as the church. Like our predecessors in the book of Acts, we are all and each coming into this slave to sin. But Jesus paid the price for our freedom just like he paid the price for them in his own precious blood. Jesus gave up infinite life so that through him they and we could have eternal life. Jesus, the Prince of Heaven, humbled himself to face death and hell and conquered both so that in Jesus neither hell nor the grave has claim on you. Jesus rose in power and tarried 40 more days showing himself to his disciples so they would know and we would know that he lives, and because he lives, I can face tomorrow. Yeah. Because he lives, yeah. all fear. Because I know he holds it, and life is worth the living just because he lives. Yeah. And that same Jesus, that same Jesus who ascended into heaven before the eyes of the original church in Jerusalem, he still lives and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. That same Jesus who gave the Holy Spirit to Peter and John and the first apostles will anoint you with the same Holy Spirit to dwell inside you, granting you boldness and unity and power and integrity. But only when we do what each of those members of the New Church Testament Church did. You gotta repent. Yes. You gotta confess. Mm -hmm. You gotta receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior. Now is the moment to boldly come before the throne. Now is the moment to be united with the saints of God. Now is the moment to re receive power from Christ on high. Now is the moment to honestly confess to the Lord. Now is the moment the doors of the church and more important. Now is the moment when the doors of God's kingdom open. Be honest with God and with yourself about where you are. If you come into this moment and though you've been in church, you've not been in Christ. Don't let this moment pass without giving your right to you come into this moment and you know you gave your life to Christ at some point, but you've been walking in the wrong direction for a while. Tell the truth, shame the devil, and come back to you. If you know that God has put a, a calling, a task, a purpose on your heart, and you're not walking in it, you're still here. Come back. Maybe you know that there's a need you have or a need someone has and they may not even be praying for themselves. You pray for them. Stand in the gap, intercede on their behalf before God your Father.
whatever it is. Now is the moment. We move in the same boldness, unity, power, and integrity. A deed that still can.
today from this place to all of your places we celebrate the Lord's Supper, the sacred keeping of Holy Communion. We want to thank all of you who have come physically to be a part of this sacrament and all of you who are joining us remotely. On the night that the Lord was to be betrayed, he broke bread with his disciples. But first he gave them instructions of how to prepare the room where they would be. So as Jesus did with his disciples, I shared these instructions with you. For those of you who are at home, find a place or a table where all of you in the household can gather together and set there on the table pieces of the plainest bread you can find. Crackers, white bread, whatever it may be. Broken into small bite-sized pieces. Take cups for each person and pour just a one swallow amount of bread or clear juice, whatever you have available. Those who were present here at the tavern, you receive individual elements. These are a little physically a little different from what we had before, but it should be a little easier to work with. Take those and, and hold them before. The thing is that the bread and the wine that Jesus and his disciples shared in that upper room, they weren't special. They were just what was ordinarily available in any Jewish home or market during the Passover. They were made special when Jesus blessed them. Yes. And so we consecrate now what has been prepared here in God's house and in your house. Yes. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, who of thy tender mercy, has given thine only Son, Jesus Christ, to suffer death upon the cross by redemption who made there by his oblation of himself once offered a full, perfect, and sufficient sacrifice, oblation and satisfaction for the sins of the whole world, and that instituted in his holy gospel commanded us to continue a perpetual memory of that his precious death until his coming again. Hear us, O merciful Father, we most humbly beseech thee, and grant that we, receiving these thy creatures of bread and wine according to thy Son, our Savior Jesus Christ's holy institution, and remembers of his death and passion, may be partakers of his most blessed body and blood. He was the same night that he was betrayed to bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Likewise, after supper, he took the cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink ye all of it. For this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for you and for many for the remission of sin. Do this as often as you shall drink remember to me. Amen. Amen. There and here, let us pray together in the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, and we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, power and the glory back Amen. And now I extend to you the formal invitation. All you that truly and earnestly repent of your sins, and are in love and charity with your neighbors, and intend to lead a new life, follow the commandments of God, and walk in from henceforth in his holy way. Draw near with faith, and take this holy sacrament to your, to your comfort, and make your humble confession to Almighty God, kneeling or standing, wherever you are, or sitting. Alright, watch your cup, open the bread side first, make sure you don't open the cup upside down. Hmm? Should peel back very easy. At home, if you take a piece of bread and let us all eat together. Now, turn it right side up. Peel back, flip the side. Let's take the cup and drink in remembrance of Christ's shed blood. Those who are physically present, you can put those back in the bag. You can drop those on your way out. Those of you at home and here, 
Having received the elements of Holy Communion, being obedient to the Lord's own commandment to do this as often as we can in remembrance of him, we conclude our time together with the blessing to follow after the doxology. Thank you. 